Hi, friends. It's Charles W. Chuck Bryant here, your friendly neighborhood podcaster, setting up this week's Saturday Selects episode. And this week, everybody, I picked an episode all about hate. Oh, I hate this. I hate it when people do that. I hate it when that happens. You probably say that stuff a lot. But what does hate really mean? What is at the core of hate? And what does it mean for the world and our community? Well, we talk about all that stuff in this episode from 2011 and July 5th. How Hate Works. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. With me, as always, is a chipper and cheerful Charles W. Chuck Bryant. Man, I'm going in 10 different directions, buddy. Yeah? I'm a little screwy. Are you? <laughs> yeah. Well, focus on this one. Okay. Okay, because we're, we're going on one direction, and that's hate. I hate to focus. Okay. You hate broccoli. Uh, I do hate broccoli, and you know that. I also hate peas. Like split peas? I remember declaring um, as English a child peas. that peas are some of my most hated enemies. I think a lot of kids don't like peas because they're m- mushy. Yeah. Well, that's the problem with all vegetables, really. They're mushy. They're overcooked. If you crunchy. undercook something... No, I've had pretty nasty broccoli. But broccoli's all, it, that's separate. It's just disgusting in every single way. But cream spinach? I love that. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, that's good stuff. <laughs> you and I shared a cream spinach at Morton's Steakhouse yes. recently, like two two ladies. <laughs> yeah, it was something. We couldn't even finish. It was so rich. It was really good. So, Chuck, we don't hate cream spinach. No. I hate broccoli. And um, one of the things I hate more than anything else is not having an intro, which I don't. Because I was looking online, mm-hmm. and strangely, there, the online world is a repository for hate in a certain way. Yeah. As in, like, um, neo-Nazi punk bands. Yeah. Pop, not, pop not bands. Hate. Huh? This article calls it pop music. Pop music, yeah. <laughs> um, or, uh, you know, Facebook groups dedicated to hate, like, mm-hmm. you know, Holocaust denial and that kind of stuff. Sure. Um but this word is so ubiquitous in our culture that there was nothing there. Like I found a guy um, in Darien, Mass, who was accused of a hate crime. Um, everybody wants to know why um, Cleveland fans hate LeBron. I can answer that. But I mean, like we throw this word around, like the you know the, some reality TV series was the show you love to hate, right? Right. Um, we 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 use this word a lot. Yeah. But yet, I found a study uh, out of the University of Texas that that asked people how often they hated, and um, nobody said every day. It's not an everyday thing. So, like, we we hate things like mm-hmm. broccoli, but we also realize that there's a real distinction between hating something and experiencing actual hate. You hit it on the head. And this is a pretty old distinction, right? Like, like uh, philosophers have, have been aware of this before. I think Aristotle was pretty sure he hated peas, but he really hated hemlock. Yeah, he and he's not Webster, so I will read his definition because he's Aristotle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he said it was a dislike for someone based on our negative perception of that person's nature mm-hmm. that is so intense that whoever feels it wants to cause real harm to another. Like, I really want to harm you. Yeah, so that's the difference. Like pe- like you said, people throw that word around, I hate broccoli, but you're not going to go out and try and burn down broccoli farms. No. I know that's silly. <laughs> I'm not going to go burn down Cubby Broccoli's family's broccoli farm. <laughs> no, you won't. That was used to fund the James Bond movies. But Josh, I think, and this is me surmising, in my own personal purview, I think there are kind of two types of hate well, three types really then. One type that you just throw the word around, like I hate that show, I hate broccoli. One that is real hate, which I think is fear-based when you don't know someone personally or a group personally where you hate a group mm-hmm. of people. Right. And then there's like the anger retribution-based hate, like someone personally has wronged you so badly that you hate them and, and cause and either want to cause or wish ill upon them. Right. Well, you just brought up a uh, huge can of worms by using the word anger. Like, there is a real debate over whether hate and anger are the same thing. Right. Right? They say they're not. It depends on who you talk to. But the people who say they're not say things like, um, 
hate is is brought on by humiliation or ill treatment yeah. or being devalued. Mm-hmm. Where anger is brought on when you're when you're treated um, in a way that you consider unfairly, right? Right. Anger is the result of um, not having any recourse. Right. Frustration, perhaps, coupled with that. Right, and that that kind of dances along the border because people who hate, you know, other groups often are frustrated. Like when we talked about the fascism in the fascism podcast. Yeah. Getting um getting groups all riled up against a scapegoat is one of the tenets of fascism, Mm -hmm. right? And so these people are frustrated at their lot in life. Their unemployment's high because of the Jews or something like that, Yeah, right? But really, they're they're angry about their job while they hate the Jews. So the two are really intertwined, but there's a lot of people think if you look at them deeply enough, they're not one and the same. Right. Well, I think a lot of times that kind of hate is displaced anger and frustration at your own you know, lot, like you were saying. Yeah. But there is, a, there is also a, um, a very um, strong physiological basis to it as well. I mean, it's an emotion, supposedly, although it's not one of the basic emotions. Anger is. Yeah, what are the basic emotions? Uh, anger, joy, fear, disgust, and peckishness. I thought it was joy, pain, sunshine, and rain. No? No. <laughs> Who's that, Rob Bass? Uh, no. I can't remember. I could sing it, but I, I can't remember. Sing it. No, no, no. I think it's Rob Bass. <laughs> no, it was, a, it was a duo. Oh, no, no, no. I'm thinking of uh, I Want Money, Lots and Lots of Money. That was a duo. That's it's good um, to be rich. Remember that stupid song? Yeah, kind of. They wrote a song about being rich. Oh, and yeah. And how great it was. Yeah. And that was their only song. So unless they were already rich, then they never were. From that song. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I don't know. You just blew my mind, buddy. (laughs) So do you hate that song? Uh, I do now because it's in my head. Sure. So Chuck, what is this um, physiological basis of anger? Well, it's pointed out in the article uh, within an Iron Maiden song, which I thought was an odd choice. There's a thin line between (laughs) love and hate. Yeah. It's like there's a whole other song called There's a Thin Line Between Love and Hate. Well, there's a much more popular song, I think, The Persuaders, which was It's a Thin Line Between Love and Hate, the old uh, Motown song. Right. Have you ever heard the Pretenders version of it? No. It's hands down the greatest version ever. Really? It's a thin line yeah, yeah. between love and hate. The Pretenders covered The Persuaders? Yep. All right. I'm telling you. All right. So apparently Iron Maiden I actually listened to that song on YouTube the other day, and it's uh, it's an Iron Maiden song. Yeah. No, I looked it up to make sure that Iron Maiden hadn't covered <laughs> the Persuaders. And uh, no, Bruce Dickinson came up with his own lyrics. His own version. He's like, that one's fine. I'm doing this one. That's right. So the point of all this, Josh, is that there is a thin line between love and hate as far as uh, the brain goes, because um, in 2008, there was a study at the University College of London, yeah. and that's in the UK, and um, they got 17 people, not very wide-ranging No, I had study. a lot of problems with this study. <laughs> but they uh, got 17 people who said they hated someone else. Maybe that's why. They maybe have a hard time finding someone who hates someone else. Maybe not. Because I don't hate anyone. I was about to ask you that. Well, well, we'll get to the personal stuff in a minute. Oh, okay. Uh, so this study, what they did was they found 17 people who hated someone else, uh, threw them under the old wonder machine. Mm-hmm. And looked, uh, showed them pictures of the people they hated. <laughs> it's just so funny to record the results. I guess they're like, you need to bring pictures of people you hate for the study. Yeah, they could have just said, "Think of the person you hate." I think, and it would achieve the same goal. I guess. So anyway, they uh, what they found out was that uh, a couple of regions in the brain. There's like a hate circuit. They call it they're the the putamen, putamen, putamen. Mm-hmm. Okay, and the uh, Jerry laughed at that, and the <laughs> uh, insular cortex. Both, both fired up with pictures of people that they hated. Right, and the, the significance of this is that both of those regions also fire up when you see a picture or think about someone you love. Which is the longest way to say it's a thin line between love and hate. Right, and I think everybody kind of senses that. It's like um, when passions flaring yeah. are... It's virtually the same thing. Yeah. They're two sides of one coin. Mm-hmm. In my opinion, if you truly hate somebody, 
the real hate to fear is not one where somebody's like, oh, I hate you so much, you know, right, because right. that that can be turned. Sure. That means that they have some sort of emotional connection to you. The one to be afraid of is the detached, calm, cool kind of hatred, because that's the one where you end up dead somewhere. Like, I'm the Green River Killer, and I hate prostitutes. Well, that brings up a, a, a an interesting sidebar. Yeah. Right? Um, do serial killers hate their victims? No. <laughs> End of sidebar. <laughs> well, the, they have long said that serial killers don't experience emotion on that scale, but they're starting to uh, to change their thinking in certain cases because a lot of serial killers suffer from antisocial personality disorder and... <laughs> people who suffer from that experience a, a range of emotions so it's not always i think it's it's both you know yeah that not you can't say every serial killer is the same well they've been saying that for a long time they've been trying to find the threads that connect them yeah. and i told you about the sociologist i talked to he was just really up in arms that psychology had spent four decades or so looking at serial killers and yeah. the best they could come up with is any personal so right. any social personality <laughs> disorder. Duh. He's like, of course they have a personality <laughs> disorder. They're serial killers. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So uh, back to that study, though, about the brain and the difference between love and hate. Um, they did see um, a difference, a key difference, because the areas of the frontal cortex associated with judgment and critical thinking mm-hmm. become less active when you see someone you love on the fMRI machine, right? But when you saw someone you hate, most of your frontal cortex, cortex, cortex is active, remains active. Yeah. So that's a big difference. But that makes sense as well, Chuck. Because I mean, if you see, I know you don't hate anybody, so you wouldn't understand this. But when you see someone you hate, you're <laughs> you just say like, that like it's a personality flaw. <laughs> you just, uh, you, 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 you tend to criticize them in your head, like, oh, you're wearing that sweater today. You look so fat and stupid in that sweater. Right. I hope you somehow get <laughs> you strangle yourself on that sweater. Yeah. So the point is that it takes like hatred as an active thing. It's an act of rumination on this. It's not a knee-jerk thing like when you might see a picture of someone you love. Right. All right. So this is interesting, right? That's what that study came up with. The, se- the 17 people. Yeah. With the, the, yeah, they exactly. They couldn't get 20, <laughs> no. you know? And the other problem is that I'm sure they were um, weird, Western, educated, uh, something rich and developed. What are you I talking? can't remember what the I stands for. And what would you just spell? Weird. Oh, oh, it's basically like the idea that all of these studies that cited are cited. A lot of them uh-huh. are they're just college kids. So right. it's like this really narrow niche yeah. of the human population that they extrapolate onto. Yeah, good point. And in this case, they just use seventeen of them. Well, we're here to report it and then criticize it. And we're done. We did both. That's right. Uh, what what's the deal with like? Uh, old hate, though. Like, don't they have some inclination of, like, early hate with cavemen and the like? Well, yeah, because the parts of the, you know, the the closer to the center or the brainstem that you get in the brain, the more uh-huh. ancient that part of the brain is. And if there's a region, like the putamen, that's associated with a, a certain thing, e.g. hate, right? then that means that hate's been around for a very long time because the, the our part of the brain... Uh, has been able to carry out that function for this long, or should, ostensibly. Gotcha. Right? But then it's also new with the prefrontal cortex, which is a fairly newer um, aspect. So maybe we just hated, but we didn't criticize. We just hated. And they think, possibly, that we developed hate as a species, or our capacity to hate as a um, survival mechanism, way back in hunter-gatherer days, uh, where... We could feel justified by, say, taking food from another group yeah, because we hated them, which I actually found pretty, that's a pretty inspiring idea. Oh, yeah? Yeah. That you had to work up hate enough to go and pillage? Yes. Okay. I think that's kind of neat because it makes it seem like we aren't naturally hateful beings, and yeah. I don't think we are. I agree. I, I, I believe everybody has hate. And everyone has a vast capacity to hate. But I don't, I wouldn't characterize this as generally hateful. That's good. Thanks. I'm kind of surprised to hear you say that. It's true, though.
All right. So uh, it's in the Bible, Josh. It's in ancient texts all over the place. Hate's been around a long time. Mm-hmm. Right? Are we going to talk about Carthage? Yep. Because <laughs> I know you love this. The Carthaginian general Hannibal. Carthaginian. <laughs> you got to stop that. <laughs> uh, Hannibal pledged to his father, Dad, I hate Rome. I hate Romans. I don't like the Italians. I hate them forever, and I will swear uh, retribution because they have seized our provinces. Yeah. He said, Father, yes, son, I'm going to (laughs) kill the Romans. And he did. He made good on that, uh, invaded Italy and did quite a bit of damage. Of course, the Romans fired back because they hate the (laughs) Carthage. Why can't I say that word? (laughs) They hated people from Carthage. The Carthaginians. And uh, in 146 BC, they did some pretty bad things like burning them in their houses while they screamed. But is that hate? Like, I don't know. And that's a. I think that's an issue that I have um, here or there with this. Is that uh, there? That's kind of a jump to conclusion. Like, is it hate? I don't know. It does hate form the basis for war or horrible acts in war? Well, I don't know because it's it's condemned pretty much in like the New Testament in the Bible. It's condemned in the Quran. Uh, Let not hatred of a people incite you. Not to act equitably, and in uh, medieval and Renaissance Europe, you mm-hmm. came up in not you, but in Italy, they came up with the vendetta, right? Which is uh, very much retribution for the, okay. for hatred. There you go. I, I it's, see. That's what I'm saying. Like I think, let's say a Roman soldier comes to your town while you're away using the the latrine pit okay. that your village has dug. Yeah. And they burn your family alive in your house while you're using the bathroom. And you come back and you see the Roman legions going away and your family's dead, burned to crisps, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think the Romans necessarily felt hatred to commit that act, but that act would incite hatred in the person that it befell, right? Okay, sure. So I think a vendetta is an excellent example of hatred. Yeah. Because somebody done you wrong and you're going to get back at them. Right. Or they did something to your father or something. You, it, the vendetta is very long lasting from what I understand. Yeah. And it's not, I mean, this is obviously we're talking about mafia vendettas and war vendettas, but it can happen on a smaller level. You might not think of it as a vendetta though, but if someone done you really wrong and you're like, I'm going to get that person back by doing this in six months when they least expect it, that's a vendetta. Yeah, but you you don't call it a vendetta. No, it's just uh, well in in Italy they do. It's just comeuppance or um, I'm going to get you, sucker. Yeah, bad people do that though. There was a word for it though in medieval and Renaissance Europe, inimicitia, which is Latin for unfriendship. It it was a legal term for hating somebody. So, okay, so what we've done is established that hatred is definitely a thing that's been around a long time. Mm-hmm. Is that what we've done? Yeah, and Chuck, of course, it's still around. Um, in recent modern history, there's other examples that we could go into. Like hate groups? Uh, yeah, well, uh, let's talk about the Nazis real quick. Because, again, we talked about fascism and one of the tenets of it being, um, uh, I guess, inciting other a group to hate. Yeah, group hate. That's... That's where we are, for sure. And a lot of that, that gave a lot of a body of data for people to study and that they're still studying. Mm-hmm. But um, one guy in particular named Martin Oppenheimer, who's a sociologist from Rutgers University, um, was basically said, like, look, the Nazis are proof positive that you can, number one, get an entire group to hate another group. Right. And that it, you do this by... Um, identifying and exploiting the the group that you're with, right. their frustrations, say unemployment, joblessness, yeah. and then basically saying those are the people who are at fault. That's how you stir the pot. Exactly. That's how you incite hatred, which has got to be one of the worst things you can do. One of the worst nonviolent acts I think a person can commit is incite hatred. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, and also I thought what came to mind to me when I was reading this was some of these same tactics like – a marginalized people, people who are uh, insecure, who are seeking safety somewhere. It's also the kind of the same thing they do with the cults and the brainwashing. 
they're seeking out these same types of people and saying, hey, you feel marginalized, you feel like you're not loved, mm-hmm. you need a, a safe haven. But they're not saying go hate someone else. They're saying just come and be with our group. Well, our, our association of like in-group and out-group is like this emotional, psychological razor blade that can be exploited in any number of ways. Yeah, exactly. You know? But it's always a marginalized people, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. Or they're... You mean the people who are stirred, who have hatred stirred up in them? Yeah. Yeah. Or jo- go join a cult or something like that. Yeah. You mean teenagers? Yes. And, uh, well, a Stanford study in 2010 basically said, hey, if you want to um, teach teenagers to hate, here's how you do it. You can't just overtly say, go hate this group, you know, hate Muslims, hate black people, hate Jewish people, right. hate gays. You can't just say that. It's not good enough. But if you tell a story that basically implies this is these are people you should hate and here's why. Yeah. Right? Like um homosexuals are pederasts and so, you know, you can't let them into certain groups and by the way you should hate them because of this story. Right. Then that know, works. I think that I had a problem with that one because it was like, that's true for everything. If you tell a story, it's going to hit home more personally to somebody. Yeah. You can't say, hey, go love uh, Seabiscuit because he ran a horse race that was pretty neat. But if you tell the story of Seabiscuit, all of a sudden you're going to leave that thing going, man, I'm getting my butt to the Kentucky Derby next year because <laughs> I love me some horse racing. I love Seabiscuit. See? <laughs> you saw the movie, right? No, I didn't. <laughs> um the uh, but the funny thing is is that that whole that study made the careers of two Stanford researchers so right but they do have a point because uh, they they point out in this article or they don't but we do um, <laughs> D W Griffith's awful um, movie awful on content uh, Birth of a Nation mm-hmm. from 1915 it's no Sea Biscuit it's no Sea Biscuit but it did a really good job of getting people to hate black people yeah in the United States yeah doesn't it feature like the I, well, since it was 1915, it's like the first in everything. But it's like the first on-screen rape uh, or implied rape. I or believe There was that. a rape of a white woman by like a, an escaped slave, I think. By a white actor in blackface. Yeah. Of course, at the time. Yeah. And um, it was a big, huge movie. It grossed $10 million in 1915. That's like that's two hundred million. That's $216 yeah. million dollars today is what is that movie really? would have grossed. Yeah. So and it was based on a play. Yeah, it is. It's based on a play in a book called The Klansman. And uh, D.W. Griffith felt so bad about this afterward that he made a follow-up film that year called Intolerance, mm-hmm. which was a three-hour silent film meditation on uh, four parallel stories of man's intolerance throughout history. Oh, I didn't know he did that. That's good. Yeah, well. Because I want to like D.W. Griffith. Yeah, I mean, he didn't write... Uh, Birth of a Nation. So he directed it. Not like getting him off the hook or anything, but I think at the time he was just trying to to make a a movie that sold a lot of tickets. Gotcha. And that was a way to do it. Yeah, that's the way to do it. And then uh, the Nazi, of course, anyone who saw Inglorious Bastards (laughs) knows that uh, Goebbels, Joseph Goebbels, was in charge of, you know, the propaganda department with feature films. Yeah. And they had one called Judd Seuss. Is it Judd or Yud? Probably it'd be Jud Seuss. So you're the one who speaks German. <laughs> How did you say Jud Seuss? I don't know. I was concentrating on the umlaut part and in, in the Seuss. Okay. So yeah, it'd be Jud Seuss. Okay. But uh, that featured a, a main character, a Jewish main character, who was shunned by a Gentile woman, and so he raped her. Oh, yeah? Among other things. Yeah. And it was required viewing for the stormtroopers. Right, to they get loved, them riled up. Yeah, they loved it. And then they give them crystal meth. Oh, really? Yeah, from what I understand. That'll do it. Um, and that didn't just go out with the Nazis. Um, media has been playing like more and more of a role um, among, I guess, hate groups, sure. hatred as a, as a concept and as a practice, right? Yeah. Because um, I think in the 90s, uh, Bosnian Serb TV showed um, something that's kind of referred to now as like a basically hate-mongering um, series called Genocide yeah. that stirred up emotion against the uh, the uh, Bosnian Muslims, right? Yeah. 
Uh, <clears throat> and, and uh, well, you know what happened with that in the Balkan War. Yeah, Al-Qaeda's done similar things on the web. Uh, obviously, the web is a good place to, to go try and get this thing done these days. Yep. And, and they, they had chat rooms. They apparently. have chat rooms. Well, Facebook's becoming increasingly um, available for people who have um, hate-based ideologies. Yeah. Um, and Facebook is like, look, we can't, <laughs> we can't do. I mean, we'll find them and shut them down if, when we when we can. But right. like, they're all over the place. Are they? Yeah, they are. Um, and then uh, also Chuck pop music. Yeah, they called it <laughs> pop music. And the reason I know I can't call it pop music is because I've seen uh, some of those specials on. I saw a really good one. I can't remember on neo Nazis, and they have you know they have musical groups that are neo Nazi songs, and they just sing about hating other people. And it's you know it's aggressive music. It's not. It's, it's not a, pop music. It's not pop. There's no synths. No, it's not Hanson. So, um, Chuck, the, the the article begs a pretty um, interesting question, I think. Um, is hate a mental illness? Because, you know, don't you have to be slightly mentally ill to burn down a house with an entire family trapped inside? Maybe. Or maybe you're just following orders. Okay. You know? Excellent. I think you just hit upon it. Our understanding of hate is incomplete because our understanding of the things that we do that we associate with hate is also incomplete. Right. Are you just following orders? Are you being whipped up into a mob mentality? Right. Do you actually hate this other group because you lost your job? Or is this emotion just being exploited by someone else, a third party? Um, I, 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 and also, I think our understanding of mental illness isn't refined enough to say, yes, hate's the product of a mental illness. Sure, because they reference um, Hitler and Osama bin Laden as two people they suspect might have been mentally ill, mm-hmm. um, or at least antisocial. And uh, they also reference the Columbine shooters. Right. As one of them suffered from depression, and they had these hate-filled rants that they ended up finding. Right. And was there a link between that depression and hatred? Right, and I guess the the that begs the question: like, did they or were they so? Was Osama bin Laden and Hitler and Dylan Klebold like so wrapped up in hatred that they were crazy? Right, or were, was um, hatred a, a byproduct of you know any mental illness they may or may not have had? Well, these are questions we don't know. But my whole idea that hatred is brought out when you are um, mistreated. By someone else, yeah, is backed up by a 2000 study of uh, people from Kosovo, and those who'd gone through the most trauma and stress uh, hated the Serbian troops who'd um, you know borne that out on them yeah. more than other people who'd maybe had pleasant exchanges with Serbian troops. I guess that makes sense. Yeah, uh, we got to mention hate crimes and hate groups uh, briefly. A hate crime is obviously a crime carried out against somebody based on their skin color, Mm -hmm. uh, their ethnicity, their national origin, their gender, disability, sexual orientation is one you hear a lot about. Yeah, disability is a sad one because it took a while to um, get that into hate crime bills. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. But uh, the, the Congress has passed legislation now that makes hate crimes more serious offenses than just like a regular assault. Well, yeah. Which is pretty awesome. Yeah. And how it should be. I remember um, when the there was a child safety law that was being passed in uh, 2006. And there was a hate crime language that was attached to it that made um, sexual orientation crimes, hate crimes, on a federal level. And there was a big outrage about it among religious groups. Do you remember that? I think so, yeah. They were like, wait, we have a First Amendment freedom to hate gay people it's part of our religion right you know so you're you're saying that 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 in and of itself is is a hate crime by saying like no these people are 
wrong, homosexuality is bad, it's wrong, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that they thought that that kind of infringed on it, which I, I don't think it does, but that was their argument for a while, and I don't think it worked. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have a list here. First, Josh, I know we have a couple more little stats um, about hate groups. Uh, since 2000, the Southern Poverty Law Center claims that the U.S. Uh, hate groups in the U.S. has grown by more than 50 percent. And Since when? Since 2000. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they had uh, the top five states with the biggest concentrations of hate groups. And this one was continued on the next page. And when I was reading it, I was like, please, Georgia, don't be on there. Please don't be on there. <laughs> yeah. And it's not. And we will count them down from five okay. to create suspense. All right. Uh, Idaho is number five for hate groups, evidently. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wyoming is number four. You got Arkansas is number three. Uh, Mississippi is number two. Mm-hmm. Two from the south. And then um, number one, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, is Montana. Yep. That's, you know, Montana. Grab your guns, fellas. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of militias in Montana. (laughs) Yeah, but there's also a lot of, like, super chill, cool, like, fly fishing, uh, microbrew drinking hippies out there. Yeah. It's an interesting mix. Yeah. And I've spent time there, and I saw both in this town, and it was, I could feel the friction, even, between those groups. Like uh, with an Indian burn? Yeah, like I was like in a, I was out in a, a saloon and having a good time with some locals, and then a couple of like cowboys came in that didn't like the the, the people from L.A. being in there, and you could like d- definitely sense there's two different types of people hmm. in Montana. There's probably more than two, but I'm generalizing. No, there's two. There's just two. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> okay, hate groups and hippies. So, um, Chuck, you got some stats for us? Uh, yeah, you dug this up right on who people hate. Yeah. Acquaintances, 24%. Friends, 23%. Mm-hmm. Family members, 12%. That's sad. Uh, ex-boyfriends and girlfriends, 12%. And uh, within the family, it's fathers are hated the most at 45%. Yeah. Mothers at 23%. In-laws at 13%. And siblings at 3%. That's kind of sweet. That's surprising to me, though. I would think siblings would be the highest because they're the ones that beat tar out of you most frequently in most families. All right. So, do you hate people? That's. Let's finish up with that. Um, I've found that the best way to hate somebody is to just check them off. So you'll write someone off, but not have that act of hatred. I I don't generally like. I will just be like, I can't believe you wore that sweater. You fat pig idiot in my head but it's usually because i'm in like a bad mood right. about something else uh-huh like i don't walk around just actively hating people it's a waste of time yeah it's a total waste of time yeah i don't i don't think i've ever hated anybody i had a situation an, an ex-girlfriend uh shacked up with one of one of my best friends after i moved state okay and we were broken up quote unquote but i also was like i'm coming back for you like Gotcha. You know, this isn't over. Were you going to find work in yeah, California was, or something? I was going west. Okay. In my in my wagon. And uh they, they shacked up pretty quick after I left and I had like a few years of like bad dreams and periodic bad dreams. I wasn't like every day I woke up thinking about it. But uh it faded away, but it was never even hate. It was just like, Oh man, why you gotta do that? Really? Yeah, it was just it's just like that's that sucks. Don't well, do that. Well, friends. That's that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is like people who go and like kill those people, those two people. Well, yeah, and, and I like think like former famous football stars. Or, yep, and that's that. I think it's all in the wiring. You're wired a certain way, and I'm not wired to to indulge those kinds of things. I suspect it all has to do with the amygdala. You think? Yep. All right. Well, if you want to learn more about the amygdala, you can type that word into the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com. You can also type in the word hate to bring up the article that we uh, worked off of today. I should point out too, Josh, that I made right with the dude years later and uh, never made right with a girl. What does that say? <laughs> I think it says that you hated the girl more. Nah, I just never felt the need to dredge that back up with her. Gotcha. But the dude, I was like, man, you can't have, like, an old friend that you're not friends with anymore. At least I can't. I don't like that stuff. Oh, well, yeah? No, nah, man, I don't like that hanging over my head. Okay. Try to make it right. That's what I say. You done now? I'm done. Sorry. Anyway, I think, did I even say Handy Search Bar? You totally threw me off. <laughs> I know. All right, well, Handy Search Bar, HowStuffWorks.com. I said that, Chuck, so that means it's your turn 
for listener mail. Yes, Josh, this is on uh, suicide bombing, and this uh, Nick brings up a very good point that I think kind of fits in with this podcast. Okay. Uh, Hi, guys, and Jerry, I think uh, y'all are very brave for taking on the issue of suicide bombing. I don't know about brave, but I appreciate it. Uh, I don't want to contribute too much to the deluge of emails, but I would like to say you could have more explicitly underscored something that I believe is key to understanding suicide bombing and terrorism in general. Both are weapons of the weak and the beleaguered. Sort of like our hate thing. Okay. Do you agree? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, we even said a suicide bomber costs about 150 bucks. Exactly. He, he points out uh, if Palestinians, for instance, had access to predator drones and guided missile systems rather than rocks and slingshots, I don't think that Palestinians would resort to martyrdom. I would also point to suicide bombings carried out by the Viet Minh during the French occupation of Vietnam or the example of Tamil Tigers of Sri Lanka, Mm -hmm. both of which movements were secular in nature. All I want to say is it seems like suicide bombings is a phenomenon often arising from situations in which there is a huge asymmetry of power between an occupying or apartheid regime regime, or a native or oppressed population. Uh, you guys did mention this, but I think this dimension is at least as important to the issue as religion or notions of martyrdom. Uh, and that is sincerely from Nick. And I kind of agree, Nick. Yeah, Nick is a sharp tack. Yeah, it's like right on the money. Yeah, thanks for that one. Wow. Okay, well, if you think you're a sharp tack, we want to hear from you, right, Chuck? That's right. Send us an email about anything at all, anything at all, to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts my iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.